Hello, 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 everyone. This is Gritty Reboot. I'm Pedro, and welcome. And I'm Meredith. Hola. So you know something that's really been pissing me off as of late? What's it's that? Just, it's the fact that we've gotten good movies that have come to streaming that have never, ever found their way to a theatrical release in any way, shape, or form. Yeah, it's a shame. You know, earlier in the year, we, we talked about Prey, and, you know, we, we you know right now we're on, you know, it's October, so we try to do at least 31 horror movies in 31 days. This year, we're way ahead of our pace. Yeah, I think we're 14 Yeah, Yeah, we, we watched almost two movies a day for the, for the most part. So, and who knows what we watch after this. But, you know, Prey, I think, is clearly the best Predator film since the original, and I think a movie that had hit written all over it. Yeah. And we never got an opportunity for that because the movie just pretty much got dumped onto streaming and streaming only because that's what Disney decided they wanted to do with the property. And I, I think that's incredibly unfortunate, in all honesty. You know, I've said the same thing for some of the animated movies that have come out, like uh, Luca and um, uh, Encanto. Yeah. Yeah, I think that's another one. Like, those movies just don't even get a theatrical release. They don't even get a moment for that to happen. And granted, you know, I mean, I know we went through COVID and we had a lot of those of those times got robbed from us, those movies that we didn't get to see with a the theater. Every now and then I lament when I see a great crowd-pleasing moment. You know, one of my favorite pandemic crowd-pleasing moments that never was, was in Mortal Kombat. They did that reboot, and we'll cover it eventually, but they do that whole scene where at the very end you have Scorpion finally return, yeah. and they play that musical sting from the first movie before he goes, get over here! Yeah. And I, the first thing I thought was like, oh, that would have been such a cool moment in the theater, and I was like, oh, wait, no one's going to theaters. Yeah. You know, and that that's sort of, that's come to an end. People are, are going back to theaters, and it's great. I, I've loved to see the numbers for Top Gun, how well that's doing, you know, how much people are excited to go back and sit in a dark room with a bunch of st- strangers and watch pictures flicker on a screen together. I think that's really amazing. But I lament the fact that this movie that we're talking about today, Hellraiser and Prey, never got their shot. Because I think Prey would have been a big hit. And I think Hellraiser would have been the first one of those movies since the second one to make some money in the theater. Yeah. So it is what it is. Sadly, that's the modern uh, entertainment business today. Yeah, unfortunately, that's just the way things are going. Yeah. So that's my introduction here to talking about um, Hellraiser from um, 1987. Yeah, we're talking about Hellraiser this week. Got a pair of these movies. We actually sat through three films. Uh, We watched Hellraiser, uh, Hellbound, Hellraiser 2, and uh, the latest film from uh, Hulu. Um, Hellraiser 2022. I have seen the future of horror. His name is Clive Barker. Once again, this movie does not go with any way to distinguish it from the other movies. So if you're going to type in Uh, Hellraiser to search, you're going to find multiple films now, which is super frustrating. Uh, I I hate it. I've just been calling it Hellraiser 22. Yeah, it's worse with Halloween um, because there's three movies named Halloween. There's Halloween, Mm -hmm. Halloween Rob Zombie, and then Halloween uh, 2018. So that makes that even more confusing. This doesn't help here. So we have to come straight out with one of my favorite things about Hellraiser. And it's the fact that you absolutely loathe this franchise. Yeah, I'm just not a big fan. I never have been a big fan since I was a kid when I first saw it. Um, It doesn't do anything for me. Um, I guess Pinhead's a nice character. A nice character. Yeah. Nice guy. He'll mow your lawn if you're injured. Well, here's the thing. He's not in a whole lot of the movies. No, he, he well, the problem is he's not in the, the very first film. And when we joked about this, he's not even he's not even given a name. He's just lead Cenobite. Yeah. Yeah, lead Cenobite. Even in the original uh, book, uh, Hellbound Heart by Clive uh, Barker, he is not given a name. Or it is not given a name. He's a very androgynous figure in Clive Barker's work. Um, and they didn't really follow through with that in the movie. Uh, at least not with Clive Barker's Nobody's given names in that movie. If you notice what the 
the credits. Yeah, just like, yeah, yeah Pinhead, Chatterer, Female, yeah. By, yeah, that's us, the fans that did that. You know, other than Kirsty and uh, Frank and Julia, you know, we don't really get anybody else's names in the movie. I don't even know what their last names are. Swanson? No, wait, that's Buffy. That's the original Buffy. Uh, Cotton. Kirsty Cotton. Cotton. Kirsty Cotton. There we go. Yeah, because I, I... Yeah, no, I, I... I've seen all of the Hellraiser movies, and let me tell you, this is an incredible undertaking. Um, so I'm, I, I'm familiar with the lore, even though, to be honest, once you're past the... The second film, the lore stops mattering quite a bit. And once you're past the fourth movie, it's all new, different lore that doesn't matter at all. So <laughs> and you've read the you've read the actual book. too. Yes, yes, yes. I, I, I've read um, um, Clyde Barker's Hellbound Heart, um, which is very similar to his um, to his film adaptation, as it should be. Uh, probably the, the the most striking changes that I would notice uh, offhand would be uh, the violence and gore is a little more played up in the movie and the sexuality is taken out of the film a little bit. Um, a little bit. I mean, it's sexuality is is dripping. Yeah, well, I mean, like, you know, I, I, there's certain elements I think you can get away with in a book, you know, that you can talk about openly. You just can't show a guy just having chains tear him up and him jerking his dick. You know, you just can't do that. In a movie. You, you can, you know, you can write that in your first five pages of, of, of your novel or novella, I suppose. It's a very short read. Um, it's about a three hour audio book, uh, maybe a couple hundred pages. So it won't take you that long to, to tear through it. Uh, if you really are interested in checking it out. And I really recommend if you're a fan of really um, either of the three films we're going to talk about uh, today. As always, um, Hellraiser 1987, directed by Clive Barker, brought to us by New World Pictures, uh, primarily a British production, even though uh, Mr. Barker was forced to kind of Americanize it, American it up a bit. So uh, that's why we have a few actors here with um, American accents, and they're just uh, American, even though this movie is clearly set somewhere in the U.K., yeah, the, it had a nice budget too. The budget was one million dollars and it earned twenty million. That's fantastic! And for, it, yeah, yeah, for Clive Barker's directorial debut, that's pretty damn good. Yeah, for a movie about sadomasochistic demons, yeah, that's that's pretty impressive. To be perfectly honest, um, every studio is looking for that kind of movie in that period of the eighties—a very low budget, uh, well put together horror film that they can use to launch a franchise. And make a ton of profit. Because that's what you want to do. Make a cheap movie. Let it make, you know, spend $1 million, make 20 That's what you want. Because I'm, Hellraiser made 20 off initial box office. But I'm sure it's made a, probably a couple hundred million off merchandising and licensing and everything else over the years from that one film. What do you think of the design of the puzzle box? The lament configuration? I've always enjoyed the design of the box. There is one issue I've always had with it. It's the fact that. It doesn't look that complicated to solve. I mean, every time I look at it, I'm like, so you just kind of spin the wheel at the top a little bit, just kind of press in, some things pop up, boom, you got Cenobites coming at you, right? Yeah. I mean, that's pretty much what we have almost in every sequence when it gets used, right? It's it's something like that. Someone just kind of spends a little time with it and opens up. I, I got a chance to um, listen. And they try to make it seem like it's hard to open, like only certain people can open it. Yeah, they, they do have that, that, that sentiment, and th that's coming from the novel, because I know... Um, when I got a chance to take a look at the first few pages again, I was really surprised that uh, Frank has talked about working over the box for like hours trying to find a way into it. And that's the opening scene in the movie as well. It's not as graphic, obviously, but it's it's the same idea. He's struggling trying to open the box uh, because Frank is dead inside and he thinks that the Cenobites will give him the pleasure he so sorely lacks. But he doesn't understand the Cenobites don't really look at pleasure the same way you and I do. Well... The movie starts off with some nasty scenes. You got some maggots and roaches, my favorite. Yeah. My God, I hate roaches. It's kind of a gross and grimy movie. Yeah, it, it really is. Um, you have Julia fantasizing. That's kind of how it starts. Um, I, I really think that there's not much of a plot of this movie. I think the movie is more of feelings like lust and, you know, just that carnal passion. Yeah. One yeah. feels for another. Um. So you have Julia fantasizing there. Um, you also get a glimpse of some of the special effects that you see in this movie. Mm -hmm. What do you think about the special effects? I absolutely love the special effects work that is done in this film. Because as I've mentioned before, this is not a big budget production in any way, shape or form. But you have very well done makeup effects and iconic looks in this film. Yeah. I mean, because that's the thing. I mean, like, 
there are a lot of movie monsters that have been designed over the years. There's even previous, you know, Clive Barker stories that have been adapted. Nobody's going to Comic Con dressed as Rawhead Rex. Is all I'm yeah. saying. You know, but I don't people even know who that is, and you shouldn't. Um, terrible film, and one day we'll cover it. But the thing about it is, Doug Bradley's design as Pinhead is fantastic. It grabs your eyes immediately. He looks otherworldly in some way, shape, or form. I can only imagine audiences in 1987 getting a look at him for the first time and having to drink that sight in. You know, because even today he feels otherworldly. When I've seen him in in nine or ten, eleven other movies, it, it still feels jarring the first time he comes out and, and the first time you see him. I mean, it's a great design. Even I think the chatterer is a fantastic design. Yeah. Um, they'd mess with it a bit in the sequel, but I mean, I just, it's a good look. There's a reason you to see the chatterer or a, a Cenobite that looks like that chatterer in almost all the movies. Cause it's great. It's yeah. a good, it's a great design. It's a great look. It works for what those characters are. Uh, the female Cenobite. I, I think that looks great as well. Her sunken cheeks, I think really add to this emaciated feel like she was almost like, starved and pleasured to death. I mean, it gives a, a great, a great feeling when you look at her and then a uh, butterball Cenobite. Once again, as we just mentioned before, none of these guys are named in the movie. That's just fans naming these characters at a certain point. Yeah. What we all know them as. Yeah. I guess, trust me, they, there's no way Clyde Barker would ever have named a character pinhead or butterball. <laughs> yeah. That's, that's not, not really his way. So, and I, I think that's the other aspect that, that I really like about this movie is that Clyde Barker is a first time director. Yeah. And there is some roughness in this film. There's some film school kind of shots of like people reacting to things for no reason that most professionals wouldn't do. But that kind of rawness just gives this film really what it needs. It makes it feel different from any other horror film. It makes it feel, first of all, uniquely British, which yeah. most horror movies from that era just just aren't. And I'm not saying the British can't direct great horror movies. I, I just watched Peeping Tom the other day. But the thing about it is it's just... That was not something Americans were looking for. Audi Horrors in general were looking for in the late eighties. Well, if you're curious as to where the aesthetic came for the kind of like S and M type look that the Cenobites and mm -hmm. uh, Pinhead have, he got uh, Clive Barker got his inspirations for the Cenobite costumes from punk fashion, Catholicism, and visits he took to S and M clubs. He also drew inspiration from African fetish sculptures. Okay, you know, and and you can certainly see a lot of that impact on on the design of the characters. Yeah. Because in in the book they're described a little bit, but they're not quite the same way. What you'd see in the reboot with a lot of skin torn away is a little bit more how they're described there. But as you can see, it's a little bit tougher to do skin peeled away on on everything, especially since, you know, your your main makeup effect in the film is going to be a skinless um character. Yeah. The female Cenobite was inspired by sacrification and body piercings in National Geographic. That makes sense with the way they have that going through that, her cheek. Yeah, round thing going yeah. through her cheek. I think that's a really nice, unique look, especially her throat peeled back. Yeah, I agree. Okay, so talking about um, Frank come, comes back, and he comes back as a really gross humanoid. Yeah. It's it's a, it's a weird scene. Um it's very gross. It's for gross for gross sake, in my opinion. Uh, it, they call it the reverse birth, but you can see that there was a lot of effects there that went into that and um, just really gross. It's dripping with like ooze. Yeah. Well, I, I think, and that's the thing in, in the book, it's, it's, I feel like it's almost more gross in the movie than what Clive Barker described in his book. Which Maybe is, so. Which is a little strange, but he would very much lean into the gore because he knows that's what audiences want to see in a movie. But, you know, we get there from, you know, we meet our, our main characters, you know, uh, Julia, Kirsty, her father, and, you know, he tears his hand up and he goes into that, the wet moldy room, basically this uh, abandoned area. No one ever would want to spend any time in bleeds all over. And that leads to Frank being reborn in, in a particularly impressive looking effect that uh, was completed pretty much once principal principal photography was done. Uh, they were just given extra money to go back and, and do this effect that Clive Barker wanted to do. And obviously it's using a lot of older techniques, but it still looks pretty good today, to be perfectly honest. Yeah, I did. Um, it did. It grossed me out i mean yeah to this day uh, it's from the 87 and yeah i mean i'm still grossed out by it yeah every everything about it re really is i think gross and wet Ugh, yeah. yeah there's a moisture to this film that just kind of permeates everything moist. yeah there's the rot in that room upstairs where frank is is holding up you know it, it's a very dirty and kind of nasty movie and i think it's got a 
it feels much different than any other slasher at the time. And granted, it's not a slasher movie at all. We talked about, you know, you feel it doesn't really have a plot, but, you know, this is a soap opera story yeah. for the most part. This is, you know, a woman who is unfulfilled in her marriage, even though I wouldn't say she's unhappy. She's just unfulfilled in her marriage. Her husband's a, a bit of a sad sack, but a nice guy in general. But... You know, she can't ever get this one experience she had with his brother that she never should have had out of her mind. You know, and she thinks about it constantly. It haunts her dreams and mm -hmm. everything like that. You know, it's this longing that even when she sees him as this subhumanoid freak, you know, who can't even stand up, barely, barely the husk of what used to be a man, you know, she still has these feelings for him and is still completely willing to throw her morals out the window um, just for Frank. You know, and <laughs> she met Frank once, you know? know, she met Frank once for like a week and, you know, Frank came in and they fucked a lot. And then, you know, he was out the door gone like he always is. But I mean, that's what that experience meant to her. And in the book, they go on a, a little bit more about like, you know, they certainly describe the sex a lot more and about why Julia is, is fascinated with it. You know, in the, in the book, and here's a trigger warning for anybody else in survivors of sexual assault. He, it's basically written as almost like a rape that she just loves basically that's what she imagines and thinks about like all the time you know any other time she has sex with her husband you know who treats her like a loving wife she doesn't want that you know she wants someone to be rough and nasty with her and frank has that in spades and it's just what she fantasizes about pretty much you know for the entirety of her adult life until the, the hellbound heart narrative the hellraiser begins yeah yeah um that's lust baby yeah, I mean that, that, that's that's all it really is, just just pure lust, you know. Um, you know, Julia's not a good person to start this story. You know, even before Frank comes around, you can tell her and Kirsty don't have the best relationship. Yeah, she's like the 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 stepmother. That yeah, and she likes. enjoys the attention from the movers. You know, mm -hmm. there's little moments like that in there that indicate that there's some trouble. And I think it shows already Clyde Barker's an astute filmmaker to show us those moments very early on to let us know how these things go and, and and really get across the same information visually that was in his book. And, and that's tough to do. Trust me, Stephen King's tried directing and really failed. And Clive Barker knocked it out of the park with a million dollar budget. Bob Keen designed the special effects and makeup for mm -hmm. this movie. He is famous for working on star Wars, the star Wars trilogy. Uh, he's worked with Jim Henson. He uh, worked on the special effects makeup for the Highlander, which is what, what he was working on when they decided to do this movie. Oh, okay. So that's where they pulled him from to do the movie. Yeah. Um, they used a ton of lube and condoms. Lube and condoms were the backbone to the special effects. <laughs> they also used this uh, material called melicellulose. It's a food thickener. Um, I'm That's that white clear stuff that strips from the, the reverse birth. Oh, okay. Yeah. yeah, that's that stuff. Okay. They also used some wax and uh, a lot of reverse photography to get the effects that they were looking for. Yeah, I can imagine a lot of uh, reverse photography. The old school, you know, you would still do reverse photography today in all honesty if it's just an easier way to get things done. The um, the effects really do look good. I mean, I, I can't underestimate, I can't, I, I can't uh, undersell what kind of work they did with the budget. It really is incredibly impressive, especially since it sticks with us Today, mm -hmm. you know, and I, I need to mention that I, I saw this film uh, when I was very, very young. Um, yeah, I was young, too. Yeah, no, because I, I think I, I did the research. I think when this movie would have hit home video, I might have been seven or eight. And I do remember my parents renting the VHS and me watching it like the day after, which honestly, like, it makes sense. I know this is an explicit film completely, but the movie doesn't really have any nudity. No. Yeah, it doesn't. For, enough. for a for sexually, sexually charged film, it doesn't really. Yeah, I think you can maybe see Julia's nipple for a frame um, and her ass at one point in the movie. But for the most part, like, you know, <laughs> I think my mom would have looked and go, oh, no graphic sex scene. Yeah, this is fine for an eight year old. <laughs> and so I ended up uh, watching Hellraiser from, from a very young age. So the music, um, the imagery, all of these things, the performances are almost like stained onto my brain, you know, just burned onto my memory. Yeah, I know so, you like the movie. Yeah, so this is a, this is a movie that, that really sticks with me, and I've always appreciated every time I've had a chance to go back and watch it and actually pay attention and, and look at it, because there, there's a lot, I think, going on in this film. And I, I think it's easily dismissed because the movie's gross as shit. So, you know, and I think people would look at it as exploitative, and that's not really what it is. Clive Barker was 
aiming for something higher. He almost gets there. It's it's not quite a perfect film. You know, he he's limited by, you know, his experience as a director and budget. But what he's able to accomplish with it is, is true, a true horror masterwork, in my opinion. What do you think about Julie as a character? Is she the antagonist of this film? Well, you know, she certainly gets the, the movie kicked off. Uh, without her, there, there is no movie. If she just leaves Frank in there, Frank will just wither away and die, I guess. Because, um, I mean, Frank can barely crawl. So yeah. if she doesn't go in there and help him, then then that's certainly the case. And yeah, I mean, I think she is absolutely the antagonist uh, of this series. She's definitely the antagonist of the second film. I think she is a more threatening figure than Frank. Because Frank, for the most part, has no power, really. Everything, all the power he has is given to him by Julia. Mm -hmm. the, the biggest mistake Julia makes is thinking that Frank loves her. And, you know, he murders her. Well, he doesn't murder her, but he incapacitates her at the end so she can be easily taken care of by the Cenobites. You know, because he doesn't want them getting him. So she learns her lesson. But, you know, after that, I mean, she, you know, she's obviously the antagonist of the second film. But, you know, for the first movie, you know, I, she really kicks everything into high gear. And I mean, she's the one who takes, you know, there's a lot of ways she get people back to the house. She's the one who chooses, you know, she's going to seduce them, bring them upstairs. You know, she, you know, she makes a lot of decisions. She even has moments in those in in those opportunities to back out. Like the one guy, she has an opportunity to be like, no, let's not go in here. But he's kind of rude to her. So she's like, eh, fuck it, let him die. Yeah. So, you know, Julia is is a terrible human being and absolutely uh, gets this film kicked off and started. Yeah, I mean, she gets her husband killed and her husband has literally done nothing wrong throughout the runtime of this movie. Is Kirsty an effective protagonist? Yeah, I, I think so. I think Kirsty doesn't trust her stepmother and she loves her father. Yeah. And th there's a little bit more implied about, you know, how much she misses her mother. You know, she handles a lot of this stuff well, if you really think about it. Yeah, that like, you know, she finds out that her stepmother is having an affair. And not only does she deal with that by going to confront her, but by confronting her, she finds out that it's not just an affair, but that this other supernatural element, the creepiest guy in, that she's ever met in her life, is now back as this zombie skinless man. And she has to deal with this problem. And by the time she's processing that, not only does she have to deal with all these facts, she has to deal with the Cenobites. And she handles them pretty well. She makes a deal with Pinhead. And, you know, listen, Pinhead, Pinhead's got patience. Like, that's the one thing I think is established in this movie. Pinhead is very intrigued by the situation that occurs to him with Kirsty and with Frank coming back. Yes, he desperately wants Frank coming back to destroy him. But I, you can tell Pinhead is like, hmm, interesting. Okay. So he's come back here. We have an instant girl messing with the box. Let's see where this goes. Granted, this is, doesn't work out that well for Pinhead, but still... Like, you can see there's the level of curiosity from yeah. him that you wouldn't find from almost any other villain. Why does Doug Bradley only show up at the very beginning and at the end? Why doesn't he, why isn't he prevalent throughout the movie? I mean, it is a, about him. It's called Hellraiser. He's the Hellraiser. Mm -hmm. So. Is he? Yeah, he would be, right? Well, who's, who's raising hell? What's, what, what's, what's the title of the original story? Uh, the Hellbound. The Hellbound Heart. That wouldn't be Pinhead, would it? So I think that's one of the things that I think why you don't find him in this movie for large sections, because this story isn't about Pinhead. This story is about Julia. Julia and Frank. So you think Julia's Hellbound Heart? Yeah. Yeah. Well, I mean, Frank it is literally the, the heart that is bound the, to hell. But I think Julia is as well because of her love for Frank and her ability to do anything that he's, he wants to get done. You know, it, you know, her, her drive and desire to see him brought back to his full potential and willing to throw her morals away completely and murder people for this is exactly what the movie's about. That's why Pinhead's barely in this. That's why Julia in the second film is set up to be the main antagonist. Because in Clive Barker's mind, like, Pinhead's just a side character. Just a fun side character, but just, just that. You know, he was not meant to be the star of this entire franchise, but he is because that's how popular popularity was. Mm -hmm. um, and like I said, that's not anything. He's not even named in the damn movie. This is a story about Julia and Frank and Kirstie to a smaller extent. Doug Bradley described Hell as a prison, the Cenobites as prison guards, Pinhead as the warden, the puzzle box is the key to the cells, and the demons are escaped inmates. Yeah, I think that's a pretty good way to take a look at it. Um, a lot of that's fleshed out in the second movie. 
uh, we get to s- spend a lot more time in hell. It's actually called hell, and you know it's a it's portrayed as a series of labyrinths, um, lo- a lot of long hallways. It's a lot of characters running through halls, basically <laughs> throughout the entire film. But I, I like the way hell is portrayed. Like people pick their own versions of it, and you know we've seen that cliche before. But this this is an earlier, you know, this is a movie from the late '80s, so there's a lot of other works that it inspired. I always think of. Um, Bill and Ted's bogus journey. I, I know that's a bit more of a kiddie film than this, obviously, but it has a similar depiction of hell. You have long halls and labyrinths. Their hell's a bit more bathed than red, but it's the same thing. You're sort of picking a personal hell. You know, you in the sequel, we find Frank and Frank is stuck in his blue balls. Hell, mm-hmm. you know, where he sees all these beautiful women writhing, you know, on the verge of pain and pleasure, and he's never able to touch any of them and he can't leave. So, I mean, I think that element in itself is, is interesting to these movies, you know, the way it portrays hell and the way it's shown and I've always loved in the second film, um, Labyrinth. There, like this demon is not Leviathan. even. Leviathan. I'm sorry, Leviathan. Pardon me. Leviathan is not even human. Yeah. Like he's not a creature. He's he looks not like the puzzle box. Yeah, he's not. Doesn't have tentacles. He's not Lovecrafty in any way. But he is. He's just this unfathomable shape. We don't know what it wants, what it can do, what it knows about us. Does it even give a shit about what Kirsty's running around doing? We don't know. We don't have any idea. And th- that element to me is unsettling and kind of scary. And I, and I like that in the sequel a lot. Um, I, I actually, I really like the original two films pieced together. The second film has some budget issues and some other problems as well. But I mean, I think it's a, a very strong sequel, especially if you liked Hellraiser, you're getting more of that. And that's always what I, I judge a good sequel by is it giving me more of what I loved in that original movie. And it's really the only sequel that does give you that. During rehearsals, Clive Barker told Doug Bradley to subdue his movements and gestures to give Pinhead an aura of control. I think that I think I like that about the the character. Yeah, he does. He is very muted in his aura to himself. Yeah, very deliberate in the things yeah, that he does, very and, and you see that fading away as the movies go on. I mean, hell, in the later films, like Pinhead's chasing people with a, a meat cleaver. So I mean, you're you're obviously not in the realm of the same sort of character, but that really adds to his otherworldly feel in the original couple of movies and the fourth film. So let's talk about the puzzle box. Sure. Is it a plot device? Is it a a plot device? Well, I mean, it's the game, you know, I mean, you, why is it even needed as a plot device? Well, I mean, cause it's how we, it's, it's the window. Like as Doug Bradley pointed out, it's the key, you know, without the puzzle box, you don't go there because that's that is the metaphor in itself for for pushing past all your physical limits to 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 find this thing. You know, Frank has fucked so much; his dick is practically dead from any kind of pleasure that he has seeked this ancient and mystical puzzle box to see if he can get some sort of jolt of pleasure. It's about crossing that line, going as far as you fucking can, just to get this mythical achievement or orgasm. I guess in his case. I think that's what it's there for, you know, that that's its purpose. And, you know, the way it's because to me, it just doesn't have much of a purpose. Well, I mean, I just that, that's the way I've always looked at it, is the, the, the lament configuration, you know, is that window into the world of hell. And you're going to have to work hard to squeeze yourself into it if that's what you want to do. I mean, later on the sequels, it gets real easier for people just to stumble in and open up the puzzle box. Yeah. But the initial concept of it, that it's just not something any jackass could pick up and be like, you know, throw it around or, you know, kind of rub it. Oh, it's opening. You know, like, you know that's not something that it's supposed to be able to do. Like, it, it is an achievement. It, it, it's an experience that you're looking for, a darkness you're willing to expose yourself to. And that's what I've always liked about the idea of that puzzle box. It is literally that line that you you're going to go across to achieve whatever the hell is you, you, you know, you want to leave everything in your life that meant to damn and, and was good just so you can follow this experience. Why do you think Kirsty makes the deal with Hellraiser or Pinhead? I'm with sorry. Pinhead. It's fine. Um, with Captain Hellraiser himself, Captain Hellraiser, oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> John Q. Hellraiser Pinhead. She's kind of courting, uh, she's kind of courting doom in a way. Well, I mean, she doesn't have a lot of, pl- she doesn't have really anything to play at that point. You know, she just got presented with the fact these demons are real, they exist, and she's fallen into their trap. She's thinking on her feet and immediately offers Frank, which works brilliantly. You know, because she has an idea, okay, I've met these evil demon people, there is an evil skinless person running around in my house. I'm pretty sure that's got to be connected in some way, shape, or form. 
you know, it shows her ability to think on her feet. She's a smart protagonist. Mm-hmm. Like she's not, even though her back is against the wall and she's so close to getting decapitated, tortured, destroyed, that she's still able to think on her feet and able to offer up Frank in some way, shape or form. I, I think it's real impressive. I, I mean, I love that whole scene. Like she's just on the edge of absolute complete fear you know, with these guys breaking the rules of the natural world, coming through the wall and just coming to claim her. And then she has this idea to just get rid of Frank. You know, I I love the way she does it. She rolls into it. And, and Pinhead, you know, Pinhead loves to torture people, but you know, once again, he's always intrigued by the things that humans do. Yeah. You know, you can certainly see that as a character. He wants to see, you know, us do our little dances and try to, you know, get away from his torture and things like that. He enjoys those little elements of chasing people and seeing, you know, uh, our plans. They must be humorous to somebody who's lived a few hundred years like he has. My last question before uh, we move on to the 1988 Hellraiser 2, where does Kirsty rank in Final Girls? She's pretty strong in all honesty because you take a look at like the bravery that she really has. She's so brave. Yeah, because in the second movie, like she just grabs a little man configuration at one point and like there's a hole to hell. She just runs in there. Doesn't even consider, doesn't even stop, doesn't even look, should I grab supplies? She just runs in like, all right, I'm going to go get my dad out of hell. <laughs> like, I no, I just, I love that drive from a protagonist. Like, something's got to be done, and I'm going to be the one to go in there and get it done. Okay, uh, only other things of note about the 87 version of Hellraiser. Uh, it took S- Doug Bradley six hours in the makeup chair to get all his makeup on. Makes sense. Um, Frank's entire dialogue was dubbed. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You, the you, dubbing work in this movie is top Yeah, notch. it's really good, yeah, because I, I didn't realize it until I watched the two movies back to back, and they actually let the actor who was Frank talk in the sequel, but it's a, clearly not him in the first movie. Jennifer Tilly auditioned for Kirsty. What a different world that would have been. <laughs> what a right. different world, yeah. I think she could have done a good job. And then Lance H- Hendrickson was offered the role of Frank, but he turned it down, fearing he would have to be a part of subsequent sequels. He later starred in Hellraiser Hellworld. Yeah, eventually he was in one of the uh, lousy uh, Hellraiser sequels. So, uh, you know, it's it's a good factoid, even though he probably would have done a great job as Frank. Um, luckily for him, it only would have been one extra movie, so yeah. <laughs> he'd have been okay. But he also did feature in Hellworld, a film that features a young Henry Cavill and Catherine Winnick as well. All right, so we start Hellraiser 2 with Kirstie back. Uh, she's in a state mental hospital or asylum, whatever you want to call it. A, a direct sequel. Like, we're literally picking up right as the first yeah. one ends. The vision is renewed. The power is reawakened. Fear is reborn because they have returned. Time to play. Hellbound, Hellraiser 2. Brace yourself. For yeah, exactly. Well, actually, I take it back. We are completely ignoring the, the true ending of the first movie, right? Where they get the puzzle box and throw it away, and the the yeah she throws the it vagrant, in the fire. And yeah, the, the vagrant demon and... turns back into a demon and flies away with it. We're ignoring that part. Yeah, totally. And, and we're picking up right before then. Um, we're assuming the cops came when they saw the house explode or whatever happened to it, and they picked up Kirsty and they've discharged her boyfriend, who we never see again. He's discharged from the <laughs> franchise. <laughs> Yeah, you get uh, pretty much all the characters that are going to be in the movie right at the beginning. You get to meet uh, the d- new Dr. Channer, Dr. Channer. Dr. Channer. You get to Chinar. meet uh, his assistant, and I forget his name. Oh, our, our, he's a love the interest for a little bit. You know, he takes the time to introduce himself like twice, and I forgot I know, his name I can't name remember again. his name. <laughs> but he, you yeah, get he's, him. he's a quasi love interest, and he's eventually just eaten by Julia. But you also get one of my favorite parts of this movie, which is when she's kind of, uh, she's she's kind of running around. She looks and she sees this corpse that's skinless and blood everywhere. And he writes, um, "Help me! I'm in hell. Help me!" Yeah, yeah. This is another scene that's like sort of seared into my memory banks yeah. as well. Help me! I'm in hell. The way the music—it's it's really up. done well. Yeah, and and it's a great 
call to action for our protagonist to have to get off the sidelines and not just say like, oh, you know what? I was mistaken. You know, I, I smoked a, some dope and saw all this crazy stuff and just lied. You know, she's all in because she has to get her father out of hell. Yeah. You know, and, and it's behind the scenes like the the movie had a much larger budget going in for a sequel and they ended up getting their budget cut. And one of the things that they lost when they got their budget cut was the actor who played Kirsty's father did not return for this film. And he was supposed to. And so because of that, Kirstie's storyline doesn't get the closure that I think it deserves, uh, which is a shame for her character. But I mean, I think the movie still works without it. But I'll be honest, it probably would have worked a lot better had he appeared in the movie. Yeah, it's a really cool scene. I like that scene a lot. Yeah, yeah. No, it really sticks with me. I, I, I like that one a lot. And if they continue to do Hellraiser reboot sequels, I'd like to see that scene covered again. And then we get a recap. Yeah. Yeah, the movie a opens with a recap. recap. And then and then Kirsty once again explains what happened in the first movie after we got a quick recap before the credits yeah. even rolled. Um yeah, um completely w- needless. Well, I mean, it's just something you did in the 80s, you know, because people were just like, "Well, they didn't get around to watching the VHS, they didn't make it the theater for the first movie. Well, we got a recap and let them know what occurred." And then we have uh Julia coming back to life. Um she's done this by a Dr. Channer taking a mental patient who has um I forget what that that uh, mental disorder is where you envision bugs and stuff yeah, crawling all over Yeah, he just sees the skin. bugs all over him all the time. Yeah, he sees that. So he takes him, he takes him over to the house where the mattress of Julia's blood is on it. Yeah. And Kirstie's obviously saying, you guys got to burn this, burn the bed, yeah, burn, burn the, the mattress, mattress. destroy it. But they, of course, don't listen to her. And, and Dr. Chandler's got evil intentions yeah Chandler from the start is immediately in on what's going on he's aware about the lament configuration he's just an evil dude so he knows about it then you get that really uncomfortable scene where a guy is handed a straight razor and he proceeds in cutting his skin open how do you feel about the portrayal of um the mentally handicapped in this film i i didn't like it no i mean it, it's not I didn't like it. it it's not a particularly positive portrayal no. in, in, in fact, any way shape or form that was one of my form. questions but i, I oh really yeah well I, I the reason i wanted to mention is because obviously he's a sadist himself chanard so it doesn't bother me in that respect because he's truly an evil person doing evil things to these people nobody gives a shit about yeah and i, I like that statement the movie is, is presenting to us because no one's ever going to stop him because nobody gives a shit yeah you N- get him opening up somebody's brain and being very ca- callous about how he exactly does it. yeah there it's he doesn't care about any human besides himself at all and julia someone who's more evil than him when he finally meets her but i, I just i it's one of those things in the movie that has always it's, it hasn't bothered me in some other films where i think like people are portrayed with mental illness in a way that's degrading and demeaning and sometimes by characters who are our own protagonist mm-hmm. and that's not what this movie does Literally, they are degraded and demeaned by the most evil motherfucker in the movie. So it doesn't bother me in a lot of ways that it does in some films. Because that's always the one thing I'm I'm always quick to point out. Like, it's okay for evil people to do evil things. But I think I have problems in a movie to where you see, like, a casual racism or, in this way, um, discriminating against people who are mentally handicapped. When you have your hero doing that, that's when I have a problem with it. And in this movie, it it didn't affect me in that way, shape, or form. Because Chandler's so over-the-top evil... And I think it does lead to, I think, one of the one of those just gross and, and particularly interesting scenes where, like I said, he's trying to cut the bugs off him over and over again until he's taken by Julie and they kind of wrestle on the ground a little bit before she sucks the life out of him. That actor is Oliver Smith. He reprised his role as the skinless Frank, along with the mental patient, which we're talking about now. Yeah. And he's also the one that writes, I'm in hell, help me. Yeah, he's, he's always the guy who, whenever you see a skinless a person in these movies, with the exception of Julia, that's him inside that suit. Yeah, I just wanted to give him some credit. That's him inside that suit. I forget who who was in there for Julia. That's not the same actress. It's a different actress when she's skinless. How is the makeup in this movie compared to the first movie? It's a little bit better. It's a little bit better. I think they've had just a little bit more time to perfect what they wanted to do. Um, there's a couple repeated shots, but for the most part, the makeup, I think, is pretty good. Uh, the Channer Cenobite, I think, is really solid, and that's Maybe my favorite Cenobite that's not featured in the first movie out of all the other films. I think his design looks great. And some of the effects that, that he pulls out, I think, look really good. Even the stop motion stuff just adds to another otherworldly feel. Even better today because we don't see stop motion a lot. Mm-hmm. You finally get, you know, Julia back and she goes through the same storyline as Frank does in the first movie where he she needs bodies. Yeah. 
So it's Dr. Channard getting her bodies and it's more mental patients. Yeah. And in this movie, like obviously in the original film, it's a much bigger deal to grab like free people and bring them in to kill them. This movie, you know, Channard's got a, a stock of people he can go and grab for Julia. There's a really nice shot where like there's a good pan across like all these people hung up that have been drained and killed by Julia. She's working on the next person. And one of my favorite shots in the movie is where she takes out uh, Kirsty's love interest, the other protagonist whose name we've forgotten is important a character disease, I guess. <laughs> but it, it's great because you see his face normal. And when the shot starts, you see Julia's back destroyed or, or still not healed properly. Yeah. He kisses her. She, they kiss and she puts the fingers in him and she starts sucking his life force out. And the camera uh, trucks back the other direction. And you see Julia's back is now completely healed. And on the other side, he's starting to melt away. It's a great effect. It's all simple, practical stuff of just moving your camera back and forth and hiding a cut. But man, it works so well. I just love some of the way they were able to get around uh, the, not having any CG effects and do some really incredible, effective makeup work. Then you have uh, Dr. Channard. He brings in the the girl who doesn't speak. I can't remember her name either, um, but she'll be known as the girl who doesn't speak. Puzzle girl? Puzzle girl. Either one. She cracks a puzzle, obviously. She, that's why she's there. That's whole her whole yeah. plot device. And then, like, Pinhead rejects her, which I think is interesting. Pinhead's like, these hands are not the one that called us. Um, and they don't do anything to her. They just let her sit there like, all right, let's see what's going on. Well, the Cenobites don't touch the innocent. Yeah, generally, that that's sort of a thing. They, like, they weren't real interested in her because, yeah, I mean, they, they can always have fun with somebody like that. But they were curious about why they were called. This is what we talked about earlier. Pinhead is curiosity. Hmm, there's something weird going on here. Let me do more investigation. And that's what occurs. And obviously it works out pretty well for Pinhead until he's murdered. You know, he goes, he finds Kirsty. you know, he finds a bunch of fun stuff, you know, until eventually Chandler destroys them all. Yeah. Which I think is a, is a pretty cool sequence. Julia ends up showing the Dr. Leviathan. She yeah. opens the portal to hell and she goes through, runs through all the corridors. <laughs> yeah, they, well, they're running through the same, they, they built two corridors basically. <laughs> and they, they milk those corridors for everything they're worth in this movie. She shows the Dr. Leviathan and all his power. Uh, and then Kirsty, along with the puzzle girl, tries to find her dad. Yeah. She's trying to save her dad from hell because he's he's kind of an innocent in all this. He really is. Yeah, yeah. No, her father had no idea what the hell was going on. He, yeah, he God. never God. did. God. Yeah, until he got... Yeah, until Frank was sticking his fingers in the back of his head. He had no idea anything weird was happening at all. So that's something to keep in mind for the movie. What's up with the ladies in the fuck drawers? Well, I mean, that's all the Frank's torture. It, it's, it's actually kind of a, a, a nice, unique thing. First of all, thank you for coining the term fuck drawers. <laughs> that's wherever you, you pull any sort of sex worker out of a drawer. It's a fuck drawer. It just seems like like a fuck drawer. I mean, yeah. you're just pulling women out who are writhing in pleasure. Yeah, that's <laughs> yeah, that's pretty much it. Well, listen, he I, I like I like the imagery from it. I really do. I like how it's done. Like, they're there, and any time someone goes to touch them, they just sort of fade away. And then when they come out later covered in red, covered in blood, I think that's super cool, too. It's a nice piece of imagery, and it, it leans into what the themes of this movie are. So I, I have no problem with that. As a matter of fact, I, I like the way it looks. I mean, that's my that's one of my big pluses on the movie is, like I said, it fits in so nicely with the first film. We get a lot of sequels and horror franchises that have nothing to do with the first movie or the, or the original film, and that's not the case here. And it's something I really dig. You know that sound that the Leviathan makes? Yeah. It's actually Morse code for God. Oh, that is that is an interesting little thing. I love when a composer or a sound team will hide a little Easter egg in there like that. I always love when there's little moments like that. Yeah. And then, you know, we get a Cenobite fight. Yeah. I never thought that I would see a Cenobite fight, but we got one. Yeah, th this is why I defend the sequel a lot, because it's got little stuff in here like that. You get a Cenobite battle. Sadly, it is not a dance battle. They go back and forth with um, their certain abilities and, and tools. You know, Pinhead throws the chains at him and they completely ignored. Chandler no-sells it, basically, and goes out there and destroys all the Cenobites and turns them back into who they were before they were Cenobites, which is a very cool sequence. Yeah, um, they... They try a little something different in this movie where they try to give the guys a little bit of a pass, the Cinemites. Yeah. They try to give them a little bit of a story and pass. Yeah. So that's kind of interesting. Yeah, because basically you... Yeah, because the movie does start off, we did forget to mention this, with the creation of Pinhead. 
Yeah. We, yeah, we see him post World War One finding the lament configuration and you know basically f- opening it up and becoming pinhead. You know, we see that sequence, so we know that there is a person behind that, you know, because in the first movie, you have no concept of that. In the original uh, story, you'd have no concept of that. So that's something new that Clive Barker and the other writers added when this film was being developed. And I think it really does lead to to probably one of my favorite scenes in the movie. You have the female Cenobite turned back into a woman, who, by the way, who is not the woman who's in the makeup. That's a completely different actress. Mm-hmm. So for some reason that they didn't use her, uh, the, the butterball is just turned to a fat guy. And the chatter is the most interesting one because he's a kid. Yeah. Yeah. He's like a, like an 11 year old kid. Um, so God knows how the hell he found the, the lament configuration got in there, but he did. And then Pinhead is obviously turned back into the person from the original, from the very, from the opening sequence. And he's got his throat slit. And weirdly, an anticlimactic death for such a strong character. They just slit his throat. Yeah, but he'll be back. Yeah, it's not that big a deal. It's no, no big deal. Nothing really keeps Pinhead down. Yeah. Uh, we already talked about the insensitivity to the mentally ill. Um, it's prevalent in this movie. What about the phallic representation in this movie? There are a ton of it. Oh, yeah. No, I mean, it's, with a movie like this, you're going to find a lot of dicks. I mean, the Chenard son of bite. I mean, he basically has like a dick dragging him around, right? Yeah. Yeah, it's basically just the big dick that's just on his head and just that's what he moves around. That's what decapitates him at the end of the movie. And he's got little fingers and there's this weird scene where the fingers unfurl and there's a flower blooming. Yeah. (laughs) It's so weird. I like how he opens up his hands and a tentacle comes out and outside of one of the tentacles comes a finger. Yeah, yeah. (laughs) I only hoped that the finger would open up and split another tentacle out of it. I do like the way that stop motion is, is done. Stop motion was already being phased out around that time. So it adds another otherworldly feel to this whole thing. And then finally we get um, one of the worst parts of this movie, I think, is when Puss... Whoa. Didn't mean to say that word. (laughs) When Kirsty puts on a skin suit. Yeah. And apparently to trick the doctor. It was pretty lame for me. (laughs) I kept thinking of Arrested Development. There's a gag where (laughs) Job wants to put some writing on this ice chest they're switching out. And he's like, what? So buy us some more time. Like what? Five seconds before he opens it up and realizes nothing inside the ice chest. It's stupid. And that's what I thought of Kirsty's plan. I was like, but you dressed up as her to just buy a puzzle girl, like what? 10 seconds. So she can finish the lament configuration, yeah. and put everything back. And that's all she does. She kisses Chenard and buys her those 10 seconds. And that's it. Yeah. It's the only reason that she put it. She didn't even know that was going to work. I mean, Jared could have been super pissed that he got turned into that Cenobite and, and cut Julie into pieces, but she got lucky. That's not what, what happened. It, it's, it's not the most elegant way to go in there. I do appreciate Kirsty willing to do anything to try to save, uh, save a friend. I like that. I like that element a lot, but it, it's a, it's a dumb idea. It's a dumb yeah. idea, but it does get us to use uh, the skin that's left over. And that's the thing about Hellraiser, they're not leaving any leftovers. That's what I like about it. They're making sure everything gets uh, used in the movie. I, obviously, I, I don't care for that, but I, I do really like these these two movies, uh, especially as like um, watching them back to back. You know, they fit so well together so nicely. Yeah, they do. They fit well together. It just, it, they're, they're just a franchise I just don't particularly what element? For. What element of these two movies turns you off the most? Um, that Pinhead isn't more of a feature. So that bothers you. You you wish he was featured more like you have Freddy or, yeah. or Michael Myers. Yeah, exactly. You're trying to build something like that, right? Mm-hmm. Well, why don't you put him in your movie more? And you, and you don't care for the sequels where he's featured more, though. I do. I do like that in the sequel more. You do like that? In the, yeah. In the, yeah okay, he's I think I like the sequel a little bit more than I like the uh, the original. Yeah, I think there's a little bit more of a straight horror story. Like there isn't like a cheating narrative that's really running through this story. Yeah. Um, and by the way, we mentioned this before, like these Hellraiser sequels, there's so many of them. Very few actually repeat the kind of story that's in these first two movies. So, All right. Do you have anything else that you want to mention before we move on to the 2022 version? No, no, I, I sure don't. I think we, we've talked about a lot and I just wanted to get you talking about, you know, why you really dislike these movies a lot. So, yeah. All right. So. The Hellraiser 2022, it starts with the violent beginning, followed by a sex scene. Yeah, and that's the way these movies should open up. Beautiful, isn't it? It's really nice. 
You can hold it. What is it? It's a puzzle. And it's almost finished. Keep going. So if I solve it, do I get a prize? I do. No one I know in the cast, which I like. I always like when a movie uh, brings some new actors to the field. The field of play. Yeah, no, that, that is something that is also incredibly interesting when you have like a movie that gives you a whole new cast and things like that. So, And this is mostly uh, unknowns. So you have uh, uh, Jamie Clayton. She will eventually play lead Cenobite slash Ben Ed. Uh, Odessa Azion. And by the way, if anybody out there is a big King of the Hill fan, uh, that's uh, the daughter of uh, Pamela Adlon, uh, who plays Bobby Hill. She's also been in Californication, lots of other stuff over the years. And she's our lead, our protagonist, I suppose. Yeah. Why do you think they decided to go with a no-name cast? Cheap. Because you've never seen some of these people before, it leads you to believe anybody could die. Mm-hmm. Like, you know, there's 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 an economy of actors. We talked about this before. Like, if you're watching a mystery who done it, and, like, Tim Robbins shows up for no reason as, like, a weird neighbor, he's probably the killer. Yeah. Right? And same sort of thing, like, in a horror movie. Like, if you see an actor you might recognize or someone who's been a final girl before probably gonna be a final girl here too or something like that you would accept you would expect those things and that's not something you can get when you go with completely unknowns or people who haven't done this kind of work before i agree so we we started off the movie violently um we got that sex scene we have the antithesis of the violence and the sex scene so you're keeping up with the same themes of violent absolutely violence and sex yeah um the character Riley ends up with a puzzle box and gets kicked out of her house by her boyfriend. She starts to try to solve the puzzle box. She solves it and Pinhead appears. Yeah, yeah. I, I do like that she is a, a druggie um, because the first time she opens the puzzle box, she's pretty fucked up, right? Yeah. Yeah, and she's just kind of messing around. So it, it can easily be excused as like, I had a hallucination. I had a bad trip. I saw something that wasn't there. That's all it was. So I think that's a, a good way to introduce it. And also... The, 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 we should mention that the type of horror has changed a little bit. Mm-hmm. The original film is Julia trying to get people to bring back and sacrifice to Frank, who's in her house. This time they're sacrificing people directly to the box. Yes, the box plays more of a key role in this movie, which I like. Yeah, the, the box I is don't narrative, understand the puzzle important. box yeah. in in the original Hellraiser movies, but I do understand it in this movie. Yeah. It's it's a serious. Uh, part of the movie um it also has knives in it that it didn't have necessarily. yeah and it marks you by cutting you yeah and that's how he that's, that's a good idea that's how it kind of goes from level to level as it opens yeah yeah and that's the thing like it has a it does have different tiers you basically sacrifice one person get to tier two tier three tier four sacrifice 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 and you can sacrifice anything apparently so I, I think that's an interesting element, and that, that's what we want to see in a reboot, changing some things up. So, And that's a good change. That's a real good change, strong change. Yeah, I agree. I, I love that about the, the movie. I do want to mention, though, I don't think I've ever had anybody ever complain to me about the lament configuration's lack of narrative importance in the original films. <laughs> that's the first time I've ever heard anybody ever say that. So that's an interesting point to, that you do bring up, and it is far more important in this reboot. Yes. Yeah. Which is the reason why I like this movie. This movie is very good. Yeah. It happened. There's finally a Hell, Hellraiser film you like. Yes. Yeah. Yes. It was really good. I enjoyed it. What do you think about the Cenobites design? It's a pretty good interpretation of a little bit more of what Clive Barker had in mind with the original lead Cenobite, Hell Priest slash uh, Pinhead design. Uh, very androgynous. You know, it is sort of written as genderless. And even when uh, Pinhead speaks, there's a deeper voice underneath it. That adds also to that androgyny. And I like that a lot. I think it's a good way to do it. Normally, I sort of hate that process voice kind of sound for a monster. It didn't bother me at all here because I saw the point in it. Yeah. It wasn't to make the actress sound, actress sound creepy or anything like that. It was to add that that idea of, of two genders combined as one. Um, and they did pick a trans performer for this. So I think that added to that element as well. Even though I don't think you'd ever really know just by watching the movie that it was a trans performer. And a trans performer. Nor does it matter. I, no, it doesn't. I think it's, it's a great performance, and uh, I think Doug Bradley would be pleased, even though I don't know what he thought about it, to be honest. He was pleased. Oh, was he? Okay, yeah. yeah I hadn't, I did, that's the only thing about uh, reviewing a film the week it comes out is, you, you know, the 
the limited amount of critical reviews and what people might have thought. I'm glad you were able to find something on, on that. Yeah, he was blown away by the look of Pinhead. He called the look simple, subtle, disturbing, and sexy. Yeah, and that's exactly it. Like, they, they don't exactly go out to reinvent the wheel with the look. She still is recognizable as Pinhead, but it's different. Yeah. So that that's grade A work on, on that kind of redesign. You don't want to get away from your bread and butter and do something that just alienates fans right out of the gate. Yeah, agreed. Okay, what do you think of Riley as a lead? I think she's an interesting protagonist. As I've said before, in the previous movie, you know, we have someone who is related to the family and that throws them into this. You know, she is what I love to see in these kind of movies, a normal person trying to live their life, you know, and get by. And a mistake that she makes starts getting people that she really cares about killed. And it 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 changes everything in the perspective and and takes the stakes up and up. And I think the way this actress responds is incredibly strong. Mm-hmm. She's really good. And I, I would hope she has a future in front of her. Well, you never really know uh, if you're ever going to see anybody again. And I say the same thing in Prey. I don't know if I'm ever going to see Amber Midthunder in anything again, even though she was brilliant there. This actress is really good here, too. And I, I do hope to see a lot more of her uh, over the years. I think she really does a fant- fantastic job showing us that turmoil that's inside this character without flat out saying what's on her mind and what she's feeling. Yeah. Yeah. It, it, it's really well played. She handles being an addict. Well, I, I think so too. And that's a good element to throw into these movies. We talked a, a little bit about the Hellraiser design. Uh, I love the part where he, that she takes a pin out of her own head and sticks it through a girl's throat. And yeah. You get to see what happens in the throat. You get to see the, there's actually a camera inside the throat you get to see what happens yeah I, I, uh, we didn't mention uh, david bruckner is the director here i think he does a nice job adding visual flair to allow the elements that we expect from a hellraiser film you know the pain and stuff like that like i thought that was really well done yeah i, I agree with you 110 percent. it looks really good the way he shoves it in it feels painful it made yeah. me wince when i saw it, did it. Me too. and that, that's what i want to i want to feel that for my hellraiser movie. i want to see like someone in pain and actually just kind of, you know, just grit my teeth. want to make my butthole pucker. Like, that's what I want to see from these movies. Things that put me in a little bit of pain just watching. That's what I'm expecting. And this movie was able to give me a lot of that, which I appreciate. That's what I want from the Hellraiser series. One of the things that surprised me was um, th- talking about the puzzle box that you can actually lure uh, a Cenobite to, to, to their own doom. With the puzzle box. I didn't know that. Yeah, I, I feel like that's lazy screenwriting. You think so? Yeah, I, I think they were just, I think they wrote themselves in a corner and like, okay, what's a way to get out of it? And it's kind of a fun idea. But I mean, if that's the case, you might as well just run around poking Cenobites left and right. Yeah, yeah because the, the Cenobites themselves are ultimately pretty unthreatening, that unless they're pinhead, because they're slowly walking in our protagonist, you know, raising their hands, telegraphing what they're going to do. They're moving like zombies for some reason, unless it's pinhead. So that, that in, in my opinion, that element was a bit disappointing, especially in the end when it first happens, when they stab that Cenobite, you know, he's moving like molasses. He's a no real danger to hurt our protagonists that have, you know, plot armor on them. You know, these, the, you know, the Cenobites have been tearing people alive for so long and all of a sudden they just can't do it. So we can get this one plot element in that I, element didn't work for me. I like it because, uh, you got the Cenobite getting struck and he automatically goes to his fate. Yeah. He stops doing anything and he just is resigned to it yeah he sacrificed himself which, which is a neat idea it's what a cenobite would do he's probably like yeah he's yeah. jazzed about it yeah i get torn apart i, I guess that's what cenobites enjoy you know they just they do that they watch freddy got fingered on the loop they love pain how do you feel about the score of this movie so we we barely talked about it in the original film but the original film has an iconic horror score yeah. it really does and and by the way fun fact there was it, it actually was not the original score uh, the original film had a much more industrial sounding score, very dark, very moody. Think of it like late 80s Nine Inch Nails, which is different than like mid 90s Nine Inch Nails. You you Nine Inch Nails fans know. But, you know, it, it had a, a much more grimy, gothic, industrial style to it. And basically the producer was like, yeah, we're not going to go with that. So they went with a more traditional score, which is what we hear and that theme that we're used to throughout these movies.
this movie does a very nice job. This reboot, pardon me. This reboot does a nice job taking its time and giving you hints and elements of that little musical sting. Just just enough to make you remember it before it finally hits when someone... She finds notes about someone openly talking about the lament configuration and what it does. And once we have confirmation of all of that, of what truly, of what is going on, that iconic score hits for the first time. And it's great. It really is. I, I it, it just, it just kind of grabs you. It really does. And I, 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 I like the way they use it in this film. You know, we talked about Predator earlier in the year, The Predator, and that movie just used Silvestri's score non-stop that predator score yeah and i mean just like Shamelessly. no restraint to just try to remind us of a better movie this movie doesn't have to mess with that it just drops that score in there at the perfect time and then it uses it pretty liberally after that but even then it doesn't go nuts so i appreciate it i, I really like the way it was done did you mark out for the hellraiser slogan i have such sights for you to see i have such sights to show you yeah yeah th- that's nice because you always want to get those lines in the in the reboot, you know, because I even think I did the Leo DiCaprio thing. I pointed at the screen, you know, point. <laughs> I, I reenact that meme every time, you know, whether it's watching Carl Urban go, Mama's not the law. I am the law, you know, or that any time that occurs, I, I enjoy this when we watch these reboots. And that was one of those moments, too. I guess straight up, I have to mention that I don't like this movie as much as you did. Really? Yeah, I, I think you were really enamored with the film when it, when it was over. And I, I liked it. I mean, it's it's the best sequel. You know, I mean, it's, it's the best of the Hellraiser movies. That's not high praise at all. I mean, I like this movie, but I, I, I still prefer the original film. It's a bit long. I didn't think it needed to be long. Yeah, it, it does feel the it's length every hours. now and then. I think everything, what was it, uh, Vo- uh, Voight in that uh, Vishnik's character? Yeah. His stuff is helpful, but I feel like that could have been saved for the sequel. Shoehorning that end of the movie kind of hurts it a little bit. I know it's building towards a sequel, but it makes the film overly long. And I think his fate could have been something that was hinted at. And you see a little bit later because him having to live with the contraption in his chest, I think deserves a bit more exploration. Yeah. And we don't really get that. And the movie kind of rushes there when we were taking our time through other points. So to me, the movie is, is a bit uneven, but granted, I'm not saying I didn't like it. I did. I just prefer the original two from two movies. I don't. I like this movie. I'd watch this movie again. Uh, yeah, no, listen, I, and I will and I will enjoy this film, but it, it, it probably the biggest misstep, like I said, is just a little bit too much going on in the movie. And, you know, they could have scaled back a couple of things, in my opinion, kept themselves really focused on their narrative of Finley, but they, they didn't really do that. And that's unfortunate. You know, and I, I think a lot of people survived in the movie, which I think is kind of an interesting thing for a Hellraiser flick if you really get into it. You know, because really like only one person should ever make it out of there. But I. Well, that's because you got the focus on the puzzle box and how the puzzle box works. Yeah, exactly. And I, th- those changes, I think those changes, I think, are good. This is what we want to see in a reboot. It just didn't hit a home run with me. This is maybe like a hell of a double or a good triple. Like, I still really dug this movie, but it's not what what I my ultimate vision for like a great Hellraiser reboot. But it's pretty damn good. The last thing I want to mention about this movie was the makeup artist uh, was a contestant on RuPaul's Drag Race season 13, Gottmik. He's a famous uh, makeup artist. Um, He was screened in pre-production as Pinhead, but lost a role to Jamie Clayton. Both are well known as trans artists. Well, I I think that, like I said, the makeup in in the movie is very good. Very good. You know, this is for a long, long time when Hellraiser was going through sequel hell, um, you know, all because, you know, Dimension wanted to hold on to the rights to this franchise for as long as they could. So they kept turning out, you know, shitty sequels that barely had Pinhead uh, grafted onto them, as well as, you know, you know, really bad direct-to-video ideas like Pinhead video, Hellraiser video games and things like that. You know, with elements that didn't really work as movies, you know, I almost prayed for a reboot to take the, the franchise seriously again. And I'm I'm damn happy to get it. I really am. Because, I mean, you want to talk about the beloved franchise that just got the true shaft on the sequels? This is it. Like, if you're a Hellraiser fan, you know, your time's been coming. This is it. You know, you, you've got yourself a well-made, well-produced reboot. And honestly, it, it looks like people really dig it. It yeah. looks like it's getting the views on Hulu. Granted, I wish I had a theatrical view, but yeah. we, the theatrical run, we already talked about that. But... The thing about it is there is finally hope at the end of the tunnel for the Hellraiser fan to finally get the goddamn movies that they deserve. 
and for the character to be treated with the respect that Pinhead really deserves. An iconic character like that, nice to watch a movie and for me not to be terrified that it's going to be awful or cheap or embarrassing to this franchise I grew up loving. Yeah. And I will always be thankful for Hulu or or basically whoever the producer is or anything like that. And obviously David Bruckner in the cast for giving me that movie. All right. Well, do you want to see how the movies shaked out in the reviews? Yeah. Okay. So 1987 had a 4.0 user rating, 70% on Rotten Tomatoes and a 6.9 on IMDb. And then I have a one star review here. Play it on me. This is a movie that I don't have much to say about. It's bland, the acting's terrible, the special effects makeup and the CGI are subpar, there's no story whatsoever, the film style is ugly, and the characters are annoying. I have heard people say, give it a break, it was 1987, to which I say, Star Wars was made in 1977, Alien was made in 1979, and The Fly was made in 1986, all of which are all miles ahead of Hellraiser in every aspect. This is just an example of a visual artist basing an entire movie around something that would have simply worked as a painting, and in my opinion, that is all this film is. One long painting, a concept with no story. The people who idolize this movie do not idolize it as a movie. They idolize the imagery, which is why they collect models and posters of Pinhead and the Chatterer, because they enjoy the imagery. No one ever said, I love this story in Hellraiser, and no one ever will. I love the story in Hellraiser. Well, you proved him wrong. <laughs> no, I love the story in Hellraiser. It's like we talked about, it. it's just lust. Yeah, I you know. want to. That, why do humans simple. do stupid shit? Lust. And if you're not able to identify with that element, listen, I, I get it. You want a little bit something more in your movie, but I mean, that's all that drives this forward is Frank's lust for more pleasure, Julia's lust for Frank, you know, and all of that leads down this treacherous demonic road. Um. I can understand you not understanding some elements of the movie and certainly feeling like this isn't a standard horror narrative. But to me, that's why it stuck out over the years. And it's why I still enjoy watching it. I've, I've watched Hellraiser a lot and I still enjoy it almost every time I watch it, even with food poisoning, which <laughs> I think I had the second worst case of food poisoning ever when I watched Hellraiser in college once. Okay. So the 1988, 1988 uh, Hellraiser 2 yeah. got a 3.6 user rating, 50% on Rotten Tomatoes, and a 6.4 on IMDb. So it didn't do as well as the first movie. Um, here's a one star review. The Hellraiser guys really pulled a number on themselves here by following up arguably the best horror film of the 80s with one of the worst. This film just doesn't work, but in many ways, it does exactly what a sequel should do which is take what we've learned in the first film and expand on it over the top fashion. Unfortunately, this film goes so over the top that it's nearly impossible to watch. In this one, the audience is taken into hell with Kirstie's sole survivor of the first film as our tour guide. Again, this is a terrific idea and they really go all out to make hell a surreal and horrifying place, but it just doesn't work. I mean, Kirstie ends up befriending a young kid and wearing some fake human skin so she can (laughs) save her life at a movie's end. And then we have a Disney soundtrack in the background and a feel-good moment. Who's supposed to be watching this movie? Little kids? I won't complain too much because I'm not a whiner, but there's too, <laughs> there's too much meaningless carnage. After too four much minutes of whining. It, and no. <laughs> and too little story for me to rate it as anything but a disappointment. Yeah, the, the sequel's not as good, in my opinion. So I can certainly understand some of those elements. You know, little things like there's just a girl there who happens to be really good at puzzles. You know, a little more explanation to her character would help with that element. Yeah. It, we get it at the tail end of the movie. I'm like, oh, Clive, this is not the time to tell us about <laughs> this character. We're like, we're already picking up the popcorn ready to leave the theater. You can't tell us who this character is now. You do this earlier in the movie. So it, it's not as strong a movie. So his criticisms are a little bit more valid. Sometimes things aren't as fresh the second time around. But granted, I will say I do give this movie a big pass because of the high quality of the sequel and its similarity to the first movie considering the third movie's a cheesy slasher flick. The fourth movie, the director disowned it. The fifth movie is a pretty decent noir horror script that has nothing to do with Hellraiser. The fifth movie, ditto, literally the exact same thing. Well, actually, it's a much worse noir script. The sixth movie is a stupid cult movie that has Pinhead grafted on. So, you know, once you get away from all those things, like, I look at that movie with a lot more respect because it fits in. It has the continuity... I'd like for other horror franchises to have at least with the first amount of the gate, 
you know, like Nightmare on Elm Street 2 just throws all the rules of the first movie out the window to do something kind of wacky and crazy. Ends up making one of the gayest slashes of all time, which is a thankful thing, but that almost didn't work, almost killed the franchise. Yeah. So this movie barely survives. So, gentlemen, there is a reason that horror fans dislike one Roger Ebert. Hellraiser, one, not even one star, guys, a half a star. Let me give you a little taste of what Roger Ebert had to say. I have seen the future of the horror genre, and his name is Clyde Barker, Stephen King. Now, there's a blur Stephen King should have written under one of his pen names. He may have seen the future of the horror genre, but he has almost certainly not seen Hellraiser, which is as dreary a piece of goods as has masqueraded as a horror in a many a cold night. This is one of those horror movies you sit through with mounting dread as the fear grows inside of you that it will indeed turn out to be feature length. <laughs> um, Ebert fucking hated this movie. Um, that's putting it mildly. He has a lot of nasty things to say about it. It's gross nature and the, the soap opera aspects of the story as well. He, he was not a fan of this movie at all. Uh, he also gave a terrible review to the sequel. Uh, the same thing. I'm not going to read from any from the sequel. You can look that one up, but it's a half star. He didn't care for it. You can get the idea. Yeah. Obviously, there's not a whole lot on user reviews for the new movie because it just came out, um, but it has a 69% on Rotten Tomatoes and a 56% on Metacritic. And then I did find a two-star review. No one-star review. Oh, really? But a two-star review. How interesting. But it is early. It is early. Being a huge fan, I was looking forward to this remake. I thought the new Pinhead was done very well. Also, the scenes were set up very well. Unfortunately, most of the remaining cast looks like they came from magazine ads and various TV commercials. No realistic appearing people with any resemblance of genuine wor real world human being. Just boring cookie cutter characters with some wokeness sprinkled in. Dialogue and storyline wasn't any better. A small twist at the end, which is easy to predict part way through, isn't enough to save the movie. Pinhead and the Cenobites carry this film. The lead girl does her best to work with the crappy writing and is the only halfway relatable character. The rest is pretty much Hollywood commercialized redundant trash. I don't feel as strongly as he does, but Ooh, I, I I, some of his points I, I, I do agree with. Um, I've never been mad at film. Well, I take it back. I have been mad when movies have tried to um, shove woke things in my face, um, especially when it's like corporate propaganda. I don't think that's what this movie is doing at all. There's other movies I could accuse that of, like the... Um, in Avengers Endgame, when all the female characters get together and they have specifically one little moment. I love how the boys lampoons them for that. Um, those are the moments that sort of grind my gears. And, for, you know, guys, I'm a feminist. So <laughs> this movie doesn't have that at all. It's just a story it's trying to tell. Yes, there's a trans character in it. Yes, your your lead character is is a woman. That doesn't make a movie woke. It's just a slice of life. Woke was said a lot. I think that people need to reevaluate the word woke. Yeah. And not apply it to every goddamn thing. Yeah, because I think they see like a, a a black character in a movie who's the lead. And it's woke. I'm sick of you it. You know, like, pray I woke. So I was much like, no, that. it's it's not. It's just, it's a story that's trying to be told. There are some movies that do have like an agenda that they are trying to shove in your face. You know, I think you see Latin corporate blockbusters where they're like, okay, we got to hit our LGBTQ moment. So let's put that in there. You know, how many first time gay characters has Disney had, right? Yeah. You know, that, that sort of bit is what I'm talking about. But that's not what's in here. And and if you if you think that's the case, then I mean, I don't know what to tell you. If that's the way you're going to evaluate cinema, you're probably going to have a hard time with most of the cinema because most great cinemas made by guys tend to be pretty progressive. Unless you're just going to watch Clint Eastwood movies all the time. Yeah. So, you know, I, I don't get it. Um, and also, uh, Roger Ebert has been uh, dead for over 10 years. So he has no review of Hellraiser <laughs> 2022. Sorry, guys. So, Yeah. That's a um, that's a wrap. Yeah, that's Hellraiser for us. Um, you liked the new one a little bit more than I did, which yeah. is interesting. But I'm glad you finally have a Hellraiser movie that you like. Yeah, Me Meredith, the Hellraiser fan. No. Oh yeah, no, it's true. No, Meredith loves Hellraiser. No, yes, yeah, she does. Favorite no. movie. Nope, she loves it. Nope. Top movie of 2022. <laughs> If you want to tell uh, Meredith that she should enjoy many, many other Hellraiser flicks, because there's quite a few to choose from, you can let her know uh, by emailing at grittyrebootcast at gmail dot com. And of course, by getting in touch with us at Gritty Reboot at G, pardon me, at Instagram and TikTok, uh, we're at both of those, and we will answer you back as quickly as possible. And we love to hear from you. 
Absolutely. Always love to hear from you guys. And go out there and rate us. You know, give us some ratings so we know we're doing really good. So we can keep doing this for you guys. We love that. Yeah, if you're watching on YouTube, first of all, I'm sorry the show's late. It's always late on YouTube. But um, yeah, like and subscribe, please. We, we Any sort of feedback we get is appreciated. It really is. We are two people working our butts off to get this show done for you every week. So I, I do appreciate that feedback, guys. I very much do. So all right. um, next week, we have some Halloween coming your way. Fun stuff. So um, I'm Pedro. I'm signing off. And I'm Meredith. Take care, guys. See ya.